Hi everyone, I'm Judy, the YouTube lawyer. Today's live stream show is going to feature someone who was our guest previously for a different live stream, which was called How to Use Your JD for Social Justice. So today we have again, attorney Jamie Pollan. She has her own law firm in Hillsborough, North Carolina called Pollan Solidarity Law. And she's gonna talk with us about different jobs you can get with a JD. So if you're about ready to graduate from law school or if you're a young attorney who is thinking about trying some different things, then this show is for you. So let's welcome attorney Jamie Pollan to the stream. Hi, attorney Pollan former judge. I forgot to mention that she is also a former magistrate judge for Orange County. Hi, TXC tells all. Thank you for being here. So um, Loretta is an attorney also who works for the federal government in Texas. So thank you for being here. Um, okay, so um, Jamie, would you like to just go ahead and tell us a little bit about your background and how you wound up going to law school for those people who didn't watch the previous live stream show? Sure. Um, so I, um, I grew up in like a blue collar family and I will tell you, I didn't know a single lawyer growing up. Like to me, you know, my experience, I'm in my mid forties and my experience with attorneys was like, um, uh, not law and order. I was uh, trying to think of that. What was that eighties show? Um, LA law, LA law, right? Like that was my context for what uh, attorneys did. And so, um, you know, it was a big deal that I got into um, a private college. I went to Case Western Reserve as an undergraduate. I grew up on uh, the west side of Cleveland in Lakewood. My father was a welder. My mother was um, had various jobs over the course of my life. And so when I went to college, um, I really didn't have a sense of like what my long-term goals in life were like, it was like, well, you go to college and then, and then you just get a good job. Like you get paid well and that's the end of it. And so, um, I, I, uh, even though Case Western Reserve is really, um, primarily an engineering school, um, I was, I was a liberal arts major, which was definitely frowned upon within the student community. But, um, so I majored in psychology and sociology. And when I was working towards my degree in psychology, I learned about um, a an potential um, employment and it was working with kids with autism. And so um, I did what's called discrete trial therapy or LOVAS therapy, uh, working with young kids with autism. So I got my degree um, and then I was I, I was getting ready to get married and my um, partner lived in Pittsburgh. So I moved to Pittsburgh and I worked for about, <clears throat> about a year doing what's called therapeutic staff support, primarily again, working with children with autism. And this um, position that I had was, was through an agency, but the funding was through the state of Pennsylvania, the service was called Wraparound. And Wraparound Care had came from a lawsuit where a um, family that had a child with um, fairly severe, this is my understanding, obviously, I had nothing to do with it, but fairly severe um, behavioral and mental health issues wanted to be able to keep their child at home and not institutionalize them. And so they sued the state of Pennsylvania and, and out of that came this, you know, incredible statewide service of um, these wraparound therapists. And so I sort of had this idea of like, you know, that's how you really, you know, like doing one-on-one -on -one, um, therapy is, is really significant, but really how you make systemic change is to be a lawyer. So that's when I applied to law school and, um, I, I got into law school at Case Western and at the University of Pittsburgh, but I've been living in Pittsburgh long enough that I had in-state tuition, which made that decision pretty easy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And so um, what kind of jobs did you have after you graduated from Pittsburgh? So um, I, I was sort of in an unusual position. So um, September 11th happened during my third year of law school and I decided to spend my last semester out in Portland, Oregon at um, 
Lewis and Clark, the Northwestern School of Law. So I applied to take the Oregon bar, but the economy was so bad that I ended up moving back to Pittsburgh. And I didn't get a chance to sit for the Pennsylvania bar exam until February of, I graduated in the, uh, May of 2002, but didn't sit until February of 2003. So in that interim um, was like the very early days of project lawyering. So I worked for, uh, it was like a, you know, a project based, like a temporary agency, but specifically for attorneys. And we were um, reviewing documents. It was a document review for asbestos litigation that had to do with um, the, um, I, I don't know if a lot of people know that there's like asbestos or there was in certain kinds of insulation, like spray insulation. And so a lot of people who had been, you know, potentially injured by that, there was some big litigation and, and we were like, it was so long ago in the document review context that we had boxes and we were, mm -hmm. we would like pull out the boxes and we had like a sheet of paper that we would manually fill out. And, you know, all of that has, has really been revolutionized since 2003, but that was, that was my first attorney job. I mean, you know, I wasn't a practicing lawyer yet, but at least it was in that, you know, it was actually, uh, I think you had to have a JD to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but how did you even get that? You said you were a project manager. How did you get that job? So I'm not a project manager. It was just a document review for a mm -hmm. project based law firm. And, I, you know, it's been so long. I can't really remember how I got it. I think I probably just applied through like a, um, a temporary right. agency. Like that's mm -hmm. it was such a different, the document review world was like just um, just growing because mm -hmm. I think big firms realized that like they didn't have to employ full time a bunch of attorneys. And so um, as far as I recall, I applied through the agency and I was um, it was like a team of maybe like 12 of us in the basement of a law firm in downtown Pittsburgh, just like going through these old boxes of documents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember those days, too, when people could actually make really good money doing document review, you know, especially with overtime, you could be making more than $60 an hour. And if you spoke foreign languages, then you could make even more money. So that was before document review became kind of like a cesspool for people who couldn't get better legal jobs. Yeah, right. I mean, it was it was um, we did we had the opportunity to work overtime and I mean, I, I did okay. It just wasn't a very long project. Like as far as I recall, it was somewhere like around three or four months. And so, um, but you know, like even, even that job, even though like you would think that document review might be like the, um, does not sound exciting. It's like there was, you know, a treasure trove of information learning about asbestos, asbestosis and mesothelioma, like all, even these medical conditions that um, later years when I did work for a big firm, I was reviewing documents for, um, uh, we did a lot of representation of like elder care facilities and, and understanding what those medical conditions were. It was super helpful. And that was probably, I mean, that was almost 10 years later. And so one of the, one of the reasons that I was really interested in doing this show is to help young, you know, either law students, prospective law students or young attorneys realize that like everything that you do is a huge learning opportunity. And it's easy to be afraid that if you don't practice for a big firm or you don't practice immediately at all, that somehow you're never going to practice or you're losing out on your peers. But I think that, um, Everything that I've done up to date, you know, somebody who's been, you know, I'll have graduated in May, it will have been 20 years since I graduated from law school. And every one of those experiences, I've built on it, and it just informs everything that I do as a practicing attorney now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So how long did you do document review and what happened after that? So um, <laughs> I, I think that document review was um, maybe like three or four months. And then that put me into the summer of 20, 
uh, sorry, uh, 2003. And um, I, uh, I applied for a judicial clerkship for like an appellate judge in Pennsylvania. And my ex um, applied for a position. He was, he's a nuclear engineer um, in Akron, Ohio for First Energy, which was the company he was working for. And then we both got our offers the same day. And so mine was in like central Pennsylvania and his was in Akron. And given that I'd grown up in Akron, I'm, I'm sorry, Cleveland, it wasn't far from my family. So we made the choice to move to Akron. And I then applied. So I was a licensed attorney. I had passed the bar in Pennsylvania, but um, there was no way for me to get reciprocity in Ohio. You know, there's just a, a lot of practice requirements. So I had to um, plan to sit for the Ohio bar. So during that period from the summer of 2003 until the summer of 2004, I worked as a law clerk in that same company. So First Energy is a Fortune 500 um, public utility that provides electrical services. And I was actually working for the company when the um, big blackout happened. Um, I don't know how much people in North Carolina might have been aware, but like the power was out from Northeast Ohio, like all the way to New York City. Um, and it was it was eventually tracked down to like something that had happened with electrical wires that were First Energy's responsibility. So, um, you know, just like I remember that day I was working, we worked on the 18th floor and we had to like walk all the way down the stairs. Oh. And again, this was only two years after September 11th. So, mm -hmm. um, so anyway, it was, um, that was just one example, but do, do, uh, during that year, I got to work on things like um, there was a merger between uh, First Energy and a utility company, I think in New Jersey. And so doing all of the due diligence, um, I got to be part of that experience. I got to work on um, some labor and employment issues some property like easement issues, environmental issues. I even got to go out with the um, attorney who worked in the nuclear, um, with the nuclear group to Davis Bessey nuclear plant because there was an issue with the reactor head and um, there was nearly like a, <laughs> like a nuclear meltdown there. So anyway, I just had some really incredible opportunities to work on I mean, just working for a huge uh, publicly traded company, there were just lots of different things, like a company that size just does all kinds of different things. Mm -hmm. And so um, how do you think you got that job? Because, you know, working in energy, you know, it sounds like you didn't have any experience in that being a somebody with a psychology background. No, not at all. And I, I do think it had to do probably with, you know, some luck that my... Um, my ex was eagerly sought out to take this position in Akron and they wanted him to take it and sort of, you know, like they had an opening and, and because even though I was a licensed attorney, I wasn't licensed in Ohio. And I think, I mean, I got paid, you know, I don't know, something like $20 an hour. Maybe I, I can't really remember. It's been a long time, but um, you know, for me, it was just like, the opportunity to work for a company in that capacity. So, you know, I don't really know. I think maybe just, you know, in a company that big, like just having an inside, um, uh, you know, kind of route to like get, being able to get your resume to somebody that may actually be in a hiring position uh, can be the difference between getting a job and not getting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So were you always a law clerk there or did they later bump you up to being something like in-house counsel? Or, so know, I passed the license. I passed the bar. I took it in February of 20, sorry, yeah, 2004. And um, I passed and then, and then I did interview for uh, an attorney position and they ended up filling it with a lateral. So somebody who worked in their uh, business development group ended up filling that role. And so even though I didn't get it, it still was somebody who was a licensed attorney working for the company in an unlicensed capacity. And so she just, she was older than me. You know, at that point I was two years out of law school and I was probably, you know, 20, 
six, something like that. And I just didn't have a ton of experience um, just with anything. So I think, um, you know, the corporate route is typically, you know, somebody comes from like a big firm. And I thought First Energy did something really cool by hiring somebody internally that had a law degree and was licensed to practice, but had kind of come from a different route than that sort of traditional like corporate counsel route. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. So how long did you do that and what happened next with your career? Uh, yeah. Um, I worked as a law clerk for a year and then, and then I left and I did um, estate planning for a very brief time. You know, it was just um, when I go through it, like I, I try not to be <laughs> like too ashamed about, you know, the, the fact that it was just really difficult to find like good, um, you know, like good attorney jobs. And so, um, and you know, like I graduated towards the top of my class, I was in probably like the top 20% mm -hmm. and Pitt is a good law school. So it, it was just, it was just a bad time economically because of the, I think what had happened post September 11th. So anyway, for a brief period of time, I did, estate planning. Um, and I just, it, it was an unusual arrangement where I was an attorney working in an office with financial planners. And although I worked for a law firm, I didn't work for the uh, financial planners. Like that's how it was all sold to me that like the office, you know, even though I had office space, like it was separately leased and all of that stuff. And then after a certain amount of time, I was like, no, this is basically, I'm expected to report to these financial advisors. And just from an ethics perspective, I was like, I don't think I can continue to do this. So um, I left doing that. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I ended well, up can I interrupt for a sure. second, because some people might wonder, well, that's like totally different from what you did before. So how did you even learn how to do trust and estates planning? That's a very specific niche area. <laughs> I know it so is. Um, I didn't really like that was another one of the the problems was that I was sort of um, I was just sort of left up to my own devices to try to figure out how to be an estate planning attorney. And like the training to the extent that I got was like about how it was really about selling like you were selling an estate planning packet. And then there is this program, I think it's called Cowles, maybe, if I'm not mistaken, that um, you basically input certain information and it sort of spits out like a trust. And um, <laughs> so to me, like it was not, it really just, I just had a lot of concerns about whether what I was doing was ethical because I didn't, I didn't, I didn't the, the firm was based out of actual Michigan and I was practicing in Ohio. And they were like, you should really connect with other estate planning attorneys in Ohio. But like, you know, I, I, I it was just really left up to me and my own devices. So uh, mm -hmm. I definitely would not recommend that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, let's answer a question. I know Valentino has had some other questions, too. We'll get to them. Um, I think this has to do with you getting the job at the energy company. It says, do you think it's fair that they hired someone internally when you spent so much time preparing for that interview? <laughs> I mean, I mean, you take what you can get. I mean, it's a tough job market out there. If you have connections, you use them. Yeah. And I think I think Valentino is probably referring to the person that I mentioned coming oh. from business development, getting that job. And then I didn't, even though I'd worked in the legal department. And, you know, I mean, I was pretty flattered that I they even, you know, they they interviewed me. They took it seriously. And in the end, you know, there wasn't there wasn't much of anything I could do. They could choose who they wanted to hire. Um, and, and, you know, I think in the, in the long run, there's this idea that like, there's an ideal candidate, there's an ideal job or something like that. And there really isn't, they just made a determination. I think that they wanted somebody who was more experienced than me working in that position. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So the trust and estates thing, you didn't feel really good doing that. So it sounds like you only did that for about a year. Right. Not even. Oh, <laughs> there were a lot of like fast. Yeah, there were a lot of really brief um, interludes in here, and you know, I was sort of flailing. Um, my ex, my ex, just um, because his career was sort of like skyrocketing, 
And um, so I did that briefly. I just kind of realized like, this is not, this is not the right fit for me. And then um, I'm trying to remember the exact order because it's hard, it's hard to remember anymore. But I believe after that, what I started doing was I worked as a title examiner for First American Title, which is based in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I just applied probably through, you know, online somewhere, probably Monster, because that's how old this is. <laughs> that was still a thing. And um, I ended up getting hired to do, it was as a title examiner in the, um, in the equity group, in the home equity loan group. So that involved um, reviewing, um, just, you know, doing almost like a, um, a chain of title, but for an equity loan, the chain of title only has to go back as far as when, typically, as far as when the person um, takes out their, their initial loan against their home. So um, the title examination was basically just making sure that there weren't, um, there wasn't an issue with the chain of title and then, you know, making sure that there weren't any other um, liens or um, people who had any right to the title to the property. Mm -hmm. So that, that doesn't sound like a job where you have to have a law degree to do, right? Nope. Um, you did not, but they hired a few of us at the same time and we were all attorneys. And again, I think because, I mean, this is my sense is that because the economy was bad, there were lots of us who were out there doing things like document review and various other things. And so attorneys were probably cheap. And, um, you know, like, I, I don't remember how much I made, but it wasn't a ton of money. Um, but it was, it, it was real. I mean, even though you don't need to have a law degree, it's real um, law based, you know, understanding um, uh deeds and chain of title and recording statutes. And um, it was examining documents from all over the country. So uh, First American provides underwriting for, I mean, as far as I know, for every state in the United States. And so I had a sense of like where, um, where a lot of like growth was happening. I can remember a lot of doing a lot of title examining for documents down in uh, Arapaho, like, you know, in Arizona, um, outside of Las Vegas and Florida and Georgia. And those were like really boom areas at that point. And so there's a lot of, you know, I learned just a lot again, a good position to learn a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what caused you to leave that job? Um, as far, you know, again, like I, I can't really remember exactly what caused me to leave. But I think, I think, you know, my sense was that I was just sort of outgrowing what I was doing. It just mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, it wasn't it, after a while, you kind of learn that skill. And there's just, you know, then you're just basically reviewing those documents in perpetuity. So that didn't sound too great to me. <laughs> okay. And then what happened next? So as, as far as I recall, um, the, probably the most interesting non-legal job I ever had was I worked for a company called uh, State and Federal Communications, which is a company based in Akron, and they are a lobbying compliance company. So um, a, a business that's owned by a non-attorney that helps lobbyists all over the United States be in compliance with the various lobbying um, laws and rules wherever they're actively lobbying. And so um, that means, you know, like if you're um, lobbying, for example, in um, Minnesota, I can remember Hennepin County being one of the places that, um, that I had to help with lobbying compliance with. And so if you're a lobbyist and you're lobbying, you know, some uh, government official there, you have county um, lobbying requirements, you have state lobbying compliance requirements, and then potentially you could have federal lobbying compliance. Um, and so just learning about this whole infrastructure 
that our country has at various levels of government to try to have some um, accountability to lobbyists and know basically what they're doing. And probably, you know, the cynic in me would say to try to make um, money because having compliance and all of those different levels involved having, you know, having to pay a fee and register to be a, a lobbyist. So um, a really interesting, just something that I didn't know. I mean, I didn't know anything about. I don't even think I understood what a lobbyist was until I worked mm -hmm. for that company. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. How long were you there? Uh, another, another job, very brief. I was there for about a year. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Well, um, if you don't mind, um, maybe we'll just answer a couple of random questions here. Um, I know this was asked a long time ago. Um, could somebody with a JD get a job directly after law school investment banking? I think theoretically you could, but I don't think investment banks are looking to hire people through law schools. I mean, they don't go to law schools to recruit. They usually just go to like big business schools or, you know, very elite undergrad institutions to recruit. Yeah. That's my sense too. And that, um, you know, certain kinds of investment banking, this is like well outside of my wheelhouse, but I think um, it requires like series seven and all of those like various certifications. And so um, I think you could go that route, but um, it's certainly not something that typically, I just, I, my sense with you would be that, that they're looking at like business schools. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cause um, my college boyfriend was planning on doing investment banking and stuff and he ended up getting an MBA from MIT. So I don't see investment banks doing recruiting even at the top law schools. They're not looking for attorneys. And it's almost, I mean, my sense is like the kind of person that's into banking it's typically not the kind of person that's into the law. Like lawyers are like the most conservative people, like not, not um, uh, politically conservative, but just like, uh, you know, I think always see like the potential risk involved. I think, I think to have those like entrepreneurial types, um, you would be looking for a different mindset maybe. Mm -hmm. And do you think compliance jobs are worth it? I, I think so because I, like my sister has a good friend that's doing some sort of compliance job for a major bank now, and she really likes it. I mean, her job before was doing document review, but it, it seems like a good steady paycheck. You know, nothing horribly exciting, but she right, but, likes it. And think about what that means about what you're doing is you are helping a company stay in compliance with the law. Like there's something... Um, you know, to me anywhere, there's something appealing about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So Catherine says, I got doc reviewed thanks to my law school. They shared. Yeah. Because I, I remember when I graduated from Georgetown without a job. Um, yeah. There was a recruiter that I talked to who was interested in hiring me for some doc review job with Kirkland and Ellis, which hired a lot of document review attorneys. But back then it was supposed to be more prestigious, you know, to do that kind of job. Yeah. So um, let's see what other questions. Okay, so Lil Slow says that he or she is being paid 70000 a year working for a small firm and doesn't really like it, works until 7 o'clock every day, um, hopes to get out of it. Um, so good luck, Lil Slow. You know, I mean, there are jobs. We've all been there. <laughs> yeah, we've been there. We've both been there. That's why we want to help you guys out there. And you are not alone in being miserable at your, your job or hating the law firm life or, you know, being frustrated at the job market. So, um, yeah, you didn't mention what state you're in, but, you know, I, I think that's nationwide. A lot of attorneys are disgruntled or not very happy with the job market. So um, let's see. Uh, oh, okay. So Valentina wants to know, as far as law firm recruiting, why are large law firms so picky? I'm done with the big law elitism and continue to be discouraged every time I accept an interview because I get rejected each time. Yeah, it's almost like the longer you are not doing big law, the less likely you're ever going to get such a job because they really just want the best from the best law schools. Right. But like the best from the best law schools, the way that, that def they define that, 
I mean, I can remember, honestly, I remember the kid that was like the top, um, the top kid in my law school class. And I can say to you that like, first of all, he was like everything that, that you would associate with that kind of role, like white, uh, um, male, um, had, you know, gone to Colgate as an undergraduate and, you know, had come from like a family of lawyers. And it's like, you know, it's almost like, to me, it's, it's almost like a re generational recreation. Like I just knew given where I came from, like I wasn't going to fit in, in that kind of an environment. And, and so I question, you know, whether those people are really the best or whether they just have the credentials that big firms want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they can afford to be picky because there's always like turnover and people desperately want those jobs. So people keep applying. Yep. And so they can, they're flooded with hundreds and hundreds of applications every year. Plus they also do on-campus recruiting and stuff at certain law schools. So, so they can afford to be picky. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, hi, Serena. Thank you for coming back again. She asks, um, she says, welcome back. Did any law courses prepare you for any of those positions you held each time? How did you adjust? What was the most difficult part when you changed positions? Wow. Um, those are really good questions. Um, as a, uh, a now movement lawyer that sort of focuses on property, it makes me laugh because I remember sitting in my property class and being like, what is he talking about? Like he started with that whole bundle of sticks analogy. And I just remember being like, I, I, I didn't even understand what he was talking about. And now when I start to explain to people, you know, these issues of like, uh, you know, being, for example, being a landlord who then executes a lease and, and gives, you know, the, the right of possession to their tenant. I'm like, well, property is like a bundle of sticks. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I never, I, I didn't have any sense that at some point in the future that this stuff was all going to sort of gel in my brain. Um, so, you know, pro uh, leaning back on learning, um, you know, property law, even though it was one of my least favorite classes in law school, I still, you know, because that's, that's really like a heavy focus of my practice. But um, for example, when I went up to Lewis and Clark, I took business immigration, which um, I would in no way represent somebody who was um, <laughs> trying to get a uh, 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 status here of any type through their employer. But just understanding how immigration works like that. There is a, a lottery that allows a certain number of people in that there are certain visas that allow, you know, people to get married. And then these business, um, you know, the H1B visa for extraordinary um, uh, people with extraordinary skills, like those things, it, it's just like, it, I think they help me gel sort of how the world functions um, I took environmental law, I took copyright there. And I, you know, I just recently um, sued a local landlord and I just learned that the property that they were rehabbing was a brownfield property. And that means that um, because certain types of, um, uh, there were certain types of industry operated there that potentially there's like environmental exposure. And so um, I think that, that when you're taking those classes, you they may not always connect those things for you. But I think over time, as you start to get out and do different types of um, law practice and even non-law practice, you really do start to pull back in to these things that you learned in law school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think um, for me, I really learned a lot doing law practice, like these like shorter classes that I took during my third year in law school, like civil discovery seminar, those kinds of classes that were taught by adjunct professors who were still practicing. So local attorneys would teach these classes later in the day. And those were really still helpful. You know, I'm glad I took those classes. And then even basic contracts, you know, like I'm dealing with a litigation case that has to do with interpretation of a contract. So I'm remembering all the stuff that Professor Stephen Goldberg taught me in contracts during the first year of law school. 
Yeah. And I, I frequently, because um, I, I'd say, you know, um, property and contracts really in like the confluence of them being leases is kind of, you know, where my particular area of focus has been. And so frequently people forget things like, it, you know, a contract has to be supported by consideration. It, you know, there has to be an offer and acceptance. Like going back to those really elementary questions, um, I think when you've been practicing long enough, um, you can sort of forget those. And so the, those fundamentals that you learn in law school, they're always coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Okay, so Catherine is saying a friend of mine did a big law firm job and hated the long hours. Wow, quit after a week. I mean, what was the friend thinking? I mean, they should have already known that you're probably going to work until 10 o'clock every night, or at least past eight or nine, and then went back to document review. Well, um, oh, well, Jamie, we were still talking through because I know you have had so many interesting jobs and so we haven't even gotten to your big law firm job or your manager's no, job. So let's no. get back to that and then we can talk about big law again. Okay, absolutely. So we? <laughs> okay, so you did uh, the title, the title exam. And then and then I did the um, the lobbying compliance work. Yeah. And um, I went from there. I, I took a job working for a real estate investment trust. Um, and then I worked as uh, I worked as a legal assistant. I was not um, I was not hired as an attorney. I was working in the litigation group um, doing landlord tenant litigation, which from a legal assistant perspective meant um, basically acting as a liaison between the company and outside counsel to support the litigation that was actually going on. Um, the company did business in maybe like 45 states. And um, so I, um, you know, learned how to read ledgers. That's probably like the, maybe the biggest skill I got. Um, learned how to read leases, um, draft um, what we called operational default letters. So this was in a commercial context, um, commercial um renting premises in shopping centers. And so this was in the economic downturn and a lot of companies were kind of just going dark and abandoning their spaces. And so I would draft these operational default letters, which basically the leases said, you have to be an operating business throughout the term of your lease. Um, I mean, just, you know, endless number of skills that I got from that position, um, even though Again, you know, I wasn't working as a as an, a licensed attorney at that point. Yeah, but how did it make you feel? You had already been out of law school for a number of years, but you were doing a legal assistant job. I mean, you know, it didn't it didn't feel great, but um, you know, I worked like I had like a nine to five, and you know, I made enough money that um, I had a, a you know, again, I had a, a partner at the time who was doing really well and. Um, we were getting ready to start a family. And so I think, you know, these are the pragmatic things that just kind of come up um, when you're in a, you know, a not great job market and, you know, you're making decisions that are, um, you know, you're not only, obviously when you're a lawyer, you're not only a lawyer, you're a human. And there are lots of other things that um, go into those decisions. So, I mean, I was fine just because I could put my stuff down at the end of the day and go home. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes people prefer that. It's like, forget it. Or, some, you know, as, as I think Catherine mentioned about her friend who went back to doing document review, some people would rather do that than try to run a solo law practice or work for somebody else, you know, it's kind of mindless. Nobody's really bothering you. So, um, you know, it really depends on your priorities and whether you want to have a family, whether you want to be able to leave at five o'clock every day and not stress out about work once you leave. So um, I don't know if you want to address this, but I, I'm sorry, somebody's feelings were a little hurt when, when you mentioned the white male classmate that was the gunner at the top of the class in your law school class. You want to say anything um, about that? I mean, you know, I come from. Uh, well, she's I, white, I mean, and she has uh, like your ex-husband's a white male, right? <laughs> definitely. Um, you know, friend. I just from a different sort of perspective now of, you know, institutionalized privilege, I guess, and and I just everything about him, I can just remember immediately disliking him. He was he was just 
that way. <laughs> oh, you're talking about the guy that was number one in the class. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Not this person. I'm sorry that that I offended you. Okay. Okay. So Catherine is also over big law elitism and the good old boys club. Yeah. If you can tell us what you're doing now, do you have your own practice or doing something? I else actually know uh, Catherine. Hey, Catherine. Oh, oh who's um, that? Uh, she's, she's in the, our girl attorney group. Oh, okay. So she could tell you more about herself, but she's uh, a solo as well. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes going solo is the best way to keep yourself sane after working for a lot of crazy places. Um, can you make six figures with just a JD that is not practice law? Yes, definitely. Definitely. Like I, I know some attorneys who ended up being investors in restaurants and someone else who now owns a swim school. So there are a lot of other jobs that people I have a friend who's a who's a filmmaker and he has a JD. And so I mean just the opportunities the way that your um law school education will inform the things that you do later. You don't have to be a practicing attorney. There are just a lot of different things and you can make good money doing those things. For yeah. Sure. I know other attorneys that went on to work for real estate investment companies or founded their own investment companies or doing, you know, being a realtor, um, being a financial planner. Um, I'm trying to think what other jobs where I think the person makes good money, but is not actually practicing. Well, they could be like our friend, Andrew, who um, <laughs> retires early. <laughs> oh, did he retire? Yeah, he's retired now. Really? Yeah. I had no idea. Okay, well, this is an attorney friend of ours who previously, when I met him, we were both downtrodden associates working for small firms. And he, I think he was very stressed out working for his small firm. And then the owner of the firm ended up dying suddenly at her desk. Like, I mean, this is like oh. what's tragic. It's mm -hmm. like they all worked so hard and they were so stressed out. And then the boss, the founder of the firm, just, you know, keeled over at her desk. And the, the attorneys had to call the ambulance and stuff. But by then, I think it was too late. She had already died and she was only in her 60s. Oh, so wow. don't let that happen to you all. You know, everybody Do out there. Do not die at your desk. Don't, don't die at the office. That is sad. You know, oh. like, yeah, I'm sure people. I'm laughing, laughing. But it's, it's not funny. But the idea of like, you, you slaved away. And yeah, that's not great. Yeah. Although then again, people would say, oh, well, she was so passionate about the law and representing the downtrodden employees that she represented that, you know, she died doing what she loved. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I mean, she did have a family, you know, kids, I think, but they were older. Um, let's see here. Oh, thank you, Raj, for being here. Also, Raj is in Canada. Um, okay. Um, is it humane to hold a big law callback interview via Zoom with eight interview sessions with four partners? Whoa, that sounds pretty excessive. Mm -hmm. That sounds typical. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's a question for you from Valentino. If you could go back to when you graduated undergrad, would you still have pursued law school given all the challenges you went through to find your dream job? Ooh, well, you know, that's a question. I, I ask myself that a good bit. Um, you know, uh, just if you could go back and do things, what would you do differently? And really my sense is that like where I am right now, I love it. <laughs> I work for myself and I choose the clients that I want to work with and the kind of work that I want to do. But it took going through this sausage that, that, you know, Judy's taking me through, like, how did you end up here? And it took a long time and I never made a six figure salary. Um, you know, that just wasn't in the cards for me. And so um, I think I have the potential to get there as my own solo practitioner and doing what I want to do. So um, in the end, I, I don't regret what I went through. I, I just don't know what else I would do. Like, I'm a lawyer through and through <laughs> now yeah. you know, I think that way. I'm sure Judy, you probably feel that way too. Oh yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I never made anywhere close to six figures when I worked for those other law firms. I mean, people think that, Oh, you're an, you're a lawyer. You work for a law firm. Well, you know, surprise, a lot of them pay really crappy wages and hardly have any benefits. No 401k. You know, I had to save myself and Roth IRAs. 
Mm -hmm. um, and then set up my own Fidelity simple IRA at my last place. Um, yeah, so it was pretty, pretty demeaning and depressing at times. And I constantly wondered why the heck I went to law school, even though I didn't have the additional burden of law school debt. But it was humiliating, you know, like do, doing all these like crappy cases for ungrateful people, a lot of whom didn't even have college degrees and were making more money than I was <laughs> and being barked at and being bossed around by rude, obnoxious people and working for some strange people. <laughs> so, um, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's get back to going down your whole list of stuff on your resume. Okay, well, it, starts to, it starts to get better at this okay. point. Oh, it's, um, it's getting better. So while I was working as a legal assistant for that company, um, I uh, got pregnant with my first daughter. And um, when she was born, my ex then, um, he, he was just, you know, unhappy with what he was doing. He was a nuclear reactor operator by that point and applied for a job down here in North Carolina. And one of the firms that I was working with that I was liaising with was uh, Smithmore Leatherwood that um, I was working with people in the Greensboro office. And so I said, hey, you know, I'm just about to move to North Carolina. And they were like, we would love to hire you, but you have to pass the bar. And I was like, third time. <laughs> so um, I had my daughter up in Ohio. And then uh, just when she was a little baby, moved down here to North Carolina. And right around the time she turned one, I sat from the North Carolina bar and passed it. And then that was like my time to be working for a big firm. And um, it was it was a great experience. Like I worked with some really talented attorneys. And so to the extent that I have to undo the damage that I did um, by slagging some <laughs> attorneys, I did work with some fantastic practitioners. Um, I worked with Patty Ramsor, who's one of the... Um, best uh, top employment lawyers in the state, um, worked with some other really talented people. And, um, you know, I got I got that opportunity. And I, that was in 2010. So I'd been out of law school for eight years. So, um, you know, I certainly did not come through their typical process. So, you know, there are things there are possibilities, you know, you never know how things are going to turn out. Mm hmm. I see. And so what kind of work did you do at that law firm? Um, I primarily worked doing landlord tenant work because that's what I had been doing in house for the company in Ohio. And so um, I started doing that just down here, you know, actually like I was the one going to court and um, you know, representing at that time, representing the landlords. And so um, I had the right background from like all of that work I'd, done working in-house for that company, I had the right background to um, take on that work as a practicing attorney and like hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. I see. So did you actually have to drive out to the office in Greensboro every day? Not every day. I would drive out there like three days a week. Um, mm -hmm. I, and I lived in Durham at that point. So it was uh -huh. when I moved to Orange County and, and the commute was a little bit uh, lesser, but um you know, I, at that point, you know, again, you do what you have to do, right? Mm -hmm. It was crazy. I mean, it was a lot. And even to this day, on occasion, people ask me to do things in Greensboro. And I'm like, I just do not like going to Greensboro, probably yeah. because of all of those years of commuting back and forth so much. Yeah, I see. And so what, what caused you to leave that firm? I mean, I'm sure the pay was great. It was probably a big step up in pay from Oh yeah, it was, it was huge opportunity. So um, the economy once again got bad. Well, it got better. So I was doing landlord tenant litigation when, you know, after the subprime meltdown that happened in 2008 and by the end of 2012, you know, that just wasn't as booming of a practice area and they laid me off. So um, at that point, um, my father passed away and I ended up um, pregnant with my second child. And so um, in the end, you know, I think having, um, you know, there's probably a blessing in that. I don't know if I'd have a second child if, if I'd kept that job. Mm -hmm. I see. Were the hours pretty long? Yeah. 
Oh. And just, I drove all over the place. I can remember appearing in Iredell County, appearing in Nash County, uh, Fayetteville, I guess Cumberland County. Like I was traveling all over the state. You know, it was a lot and had a little, little child. And then, you know, uh, um, a spouse who had a pretty demanding job as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really tough, but you stuck it out until the end when, when the layoffs happened. Yeah. Yeah. So the layoffs happened and then um, I briefly worked for a small firm in RTP doing residential landlord tenant work. And then um, the best, I guess I said the lobbying job was the most interesting. That's actually not true. The most interesting non-practicing job I had was working as a magistrate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, that's what, what I'm interested in hearing more about. So can you tell us, oops, there I go kicking the table. Um, so <laughs> how, did, how did you get the job in the first place? Was it very competitive? Did you have to interview with a lot of people? No, it wasn't. It, it's it's political. So I, I had been doing the appearing in um, small claims court. And um, one of the magistrates who did... Um, heard small claims had seen me in there a couple of times and was like, we're looking for an attorney magistrate. So in North Carolina to be a magistrate, you do not have to be an attorney. So in Orange County in particular, they um, uh, there's a, a desire to find attorneys because small claims, I mean, it's only one of the things that magistrates do, but hearing small claims cases and making decisions and making decisions that are, you know, based on the law. I, I don't even know. It was hard enough as, as a person who was a practicing attorney and who had had many years of different kinds of experience. It was very difficult. It is really hard to hear evidence and make determinations and, and do it well. So um, I applied a magistrate um, applies to the clerk of court, and then uh, is hired by the resident superior court judge and then works for the chief district court judge. So Jamie Stanford was the clerk of court at the time. Uh, uh, Carl Fox was the resident superior court judge who hired me. And then I worked for Joe Buckner, who was the um, uh, chief district court judge. Mm -hmm. I see. So did you start out doing small claims or what were your duties? Oh, I mean, the primary duties of a magistrate are um, are making probable cause determinations for uh, arrests and arrest warrants, um, issuing search warrants, issuing involuntary commitment orders. And then on top of that, you also have this small claims responsibility. So, um, oh, and marriages. That was, that was the most fun part was being able to actually marry people. Oh, it was really cool. We, I would take people if I could, and on a nice day, take people outside and, and right in front of the old historic courthouse here in Hillsboro, perform the marriage ceremonies. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Kind of like a hodgepodge of different things, but was it pretty high stress because you had to deal with so many people all the time and people getting mad at you? I mean, there's no set of circumstances where somebody sees the magistrate unless they're getting married, where they're not having one of the worst days of their life. So um, there is a lot of that, you know, somebody's either under arrest or, you know, you don't see the people who are being commitment committed. You see the people who are committing somebody, which is usually, um, you know, relatives who have somebody who's having, you know, severe um, mental health breakdown um, and then, you know, small claims, I mean, it's usually, it's not, you know, you're dealing with people who are unrepresented for the most part. Um, you know, there some lawyers do some practice, like the people who represent landlords, typically, you know, they are attorneys, but they don't, you don't have to be, you can actually be a property manager. So, um, it was, well, and it, we work 24 hour shifts. So I would only work like six 24 hour shifts a month, but, um, working a 24 hour shift, I cannot tell you how hard that is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, Wait, didn't, didn't you say you had to sometimes like sleep in the office or something to be the overnight magistrate or something? There was a bed in each office and um, we all had like a sleeping bag that we would put on top of the bed. And, you know, on your night, you could, um, in Orange County, they allowed us to go home like the the, you know, like the open hours 
where you were supposed to be in the office was from basically around eight o'clock till about five o'clock. And then you could go um, sort of after hours and then you just have to respond to the office um, to go back. But I can tell you like, I, so a lot of times I would like go home and have dinner cause I had two little children at that point. And, you know, but like I could put one scoop of food in my mouth and then be called back to the office. So, um, and certainly if you are in like a deep sleep and somebody calls you and, and, you know, you have to, you have to get in the car and drive to work at like three 30 in the morning. I mean, at a certain point, most of the time I just prefer to stay there. Mm-hmm. I see. Yeah, that's really tough. So, um, so the nights that you had to spend a night there, then obviously your, your husband then had to take care of the kids. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Wow. Wow. They were his kids too. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay. <laughs> well, interesting. Okay. Well, so how long did you do the mattress stretch job? Uh, I did that for two years. Um, and, you know, then I worked for another small firm. And then at the beginning of COVID, I was like, you know, now's the time. Like now's the time to go out on my own. And, you know, I've, I've built on every single one of those positions. And it just means that my law practice, I, I say I have an eclectic law practice because I do things as broad as uh, representing people in criminal matters. I represent protesters. Um, I, uh, represent people in disputes with their builders and I do this community organizing type, um, movement lawyering. I, I, I just have helped people whose relatives have been involuntarily committed. It just means, um, I have, I just have this really kind of interesting ability to do a broad based, um, representation. And so I'm grateful for all of these sort of missteps, because I feel like they've kind of uh, brought me to where I am today. Yeah, that's right. And now you know how to handle a big variety of different types of cases, too. Um, mm -hmm. So Tony asked, do civil litigation cases ever have family or friends that pitch in? So he sees GoFundMes. Um, not that much in the cases that I handle, but once in a while, I might have a client whose parent or sibling might be helping to pay their attorney's fees. What about and I've you? had a few, um, like I'm representing a church in Durham right now, and they have a GoFundMe to help because they're fighting the tax department. And so um, there are occasions, uh, there was another GoFundMe for folks that were protesters in Alamance County. I mean, probably the nature of what I do means that, that it may come up more in my practice than it does in Judy's. Mm -hmm. I see. Do employers ever see a JD on a CV and consider it overqualified, like a job for consulting or insurance fraud? New skills? Um, probably. I mean, you definitely hear about some people feeling like they need to leave the JD off of their resume um, if they really want a job that most people would say, well, why would you want this? You're going to leave us as soon as you get a real attorney job. Right. What, what do you think, Jamie? Well, I mean, I did all of those different things and um, I, you know, I would be really honest with the, the people that I work for. I never went into a job with the idea, like, I'm only going to do this until I end up, you know, finding a different job. It was like, hopefully I will work at this job and then opportunities will open up and I'll be able to move. Like, I'll have the ability that like the other legal assistants wouldn't have that capacity. And so unfortunately, because a lot of this moving from position to position was also driven by um, my ex's career. So I think some sometimes it wasn't it wasn't that I left a place because I was dissatisfied. It was like when I explained like we moved to North Carolina, that was based on opportunities for his career. I certainly didn't need to take and pass a third bar exam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was more than enough, but, you know, I, that was the position that I was in. So I think, you know, I, I think it just, it probably just depends on who, who's interviewing you. Um, but, you know, certainly I wouldn't go into any position with the intention that like, I'm going to bail as soon as, you know, some attorney position comes up, because frankly, you might not like what you're doing as an attorney. You might like it being an insurance fraud investigator. 
man, that sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah, or doing some non attorney position for an insurance company or bank. Yeah, because um, when I was starting my own practice and things were going poorly, I interviewed for a career counselor job at UNC Law School. And the lady ultimately didn't give me the job. I was like so pissed off because, you know, my career was in the in the gutter. And I really wanted this job. <laughs> and, and she goes, well, what's going to happen if your law practice takes off? And I'm thinking, well, it isn't taking off. That's why I'm <laughs> applying for this job. Please give me this job. You know, it probably would have paid about like $65,000 back then. But I wanted that career counselor job and I couldn't even get it. So, um, so you just never know. I mean, I guess we can't make any blanket statements, but as Jamie said, you really want to give off the impression during the interview that you are devoted to this job and that you're not looking to jump ship as soon as something better comes along. Yeah. Um, yeah, no problem. <laughs> Ask away, although it's getting to be about an hour already. Yeah. Dr. Sev says you've had a, you've had a, Really interesting storied career, three bar exams. You go, Jamie. You're amazing. <laughs> I always I always tell people that that's a sign of all of the missteps that I took. Mm -hmm. um, I have never met another attorney that has um, taken and passed three bar exams on the first try. Mm -hmm. I've known people who've had to take the bar exam multiple times or a few people that have taken two, but um, it was not my favorite thing but um you know again it's i'm where i'm at because of all of that yeah yeah okay and serena asks, what do you think makes us successful lawyers in your years of observation why do you think some people are happy about being lawyers while others aren't um i think being a successful lawyer is is in connecting with your clients i mean you have to be competent you have to know what you're doing um, those things, but there are many, many people that are competent and can, you know, provide a minimum service, but what draws your clients to you and makes them come back is, you know, how you interact with them and how you respond to them. And I think, um, you know, I'm really fortunate that I have, I have a lot of really good clients that come back and oh, come back again and again, because, you know, they, you know, it's, it, I have a friend who always just gives me a hard time about how I become friends with all of my clients. And I'm like, I, I can't help it. <laughs> yeah, but that means you still have a heart. You haven't yes. become so jaded and embittered practicing law all these years and getting older, you know, to the point where you don't give a crap anymore. You know? yeah. And the, the worst part about practicing law, in my opinion, is other lawyers. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And some clients, if you don't do a really good job weeding out the problem clients. Yeah. If you, I mean, you start to learn that too, over time, like if you get a bad feeling from somebody early on, just to, you know, when they're dangling money at you, you know, it's, you just, I've learned to trust my gut. And if I have the sense that somebody is going to be difficult, then, you know, I'm willing to let that person go and find somebody else. Yeah, and that's the beauty of us being self-employed because when you work for a firm, a lot of times you can't just tell the client to buzz off and leave you alone. Yeah. Um, okay, so what about this? You want to create your own YouTube channel? <laughs> you have so much to share with the world. I love that Judy does this. I think it's incredible, but it, it's another one of those skills that um, I appreciate that all I had to do is click on a link and chat with Judy. So yeah, I'm yeah, you can come be, back anytime. And yeah, she'll be our guest and I'll try to get that whoever it was, Catherine Hutchinson or Hutchinson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is she in North Carolina? She is. She's uh, okay. based in, um, she's in Willow Springs. She's, she's helped me a little bit. Um, just uh, recently with a big case that I had. And so she, she's got an interesting story herself. It's not as long as mine. <laughs> okay, cool. And hopefully our friend Andrew will be willing to be a guest too, now that he no longer works for the oh, yeah. government. I would love, you and I should interview Andrew. That would be okay. Fantastic. Yeah. We'll have, have like a joint interview, multi, multi attorney <laughs> interview. Okay. Good idea. I like, forget it. I I'm fishing. <laughs> Okay. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I'm okay. So Ifan, thank you for being here again. Could you share what childcare options you used given that you had a busy schedule? Well, um, you know, Judy alluded to this, um, but I did have a, a spouse that was just, 
and still is, even though we're not together, he is just a devoted father. And so um, I think that, you know, having a partner that is in, in it equally as far as uh, childcare is super, super important. But, um, you know, I use daycares, I use drop-in places. I've had, you know, friends help. My children are now uh, almost 13 and eight, and eight, just over eight. And so um, they, I don't have childcare for them anymore. I have a home office. I actually have this really cool setup where I have a vintage storefront on my property where my house is. So um, they're, you know, they will on occasion, if they were with me, I'm sure one of them would have popped in here tonight, but they're with their dad. Um, and so thankfully at some point your children do grow up and they don't need, you know, that same kind of one-on-one -on -one care. But um, I did many, many different things and, you know, have always been incredibly grateful to the people who've helped me out with my children because, um, you know, like even now, sometimes I have to have somebody pick up my younger daughter at school and somebody who was the single mother, she's now married. And, um, you know, having networks of people that help with that stuff is huge. I don't know. What about you, Judy? What have you done? Oh, yeah. I mean, you just have to find the right daycare. And here's another thing that people don't realize. If you're planning on having kids and you're an attorney, I mean, a lot of daycares close by 530 or 6. And even up near Northern Virginia, where my sister lives and, you know, where I used to live, a lot of the daycares would close by 630 or 7. So what do you do if you're working for a law firm that expects you to work past 8 o'clock every night? Or you could potentially end up having to work till 10 o'clock. I mean, it's just totally insane. Like, it's really, really hard to juggle, you know, being a parent and, you know, trying to have a really great, you know, blazing legal career. So something has to give. I think, um, you know, if you can't find a daycare that's open late, that can accommodate your work schedule, then you'll probably have to pay a private nanny or find, you know, like find anybody, you know, go to care.com and try to find someone like a, like a graduate student or like an older older mom whose kids are all grown up or someone in the neighborhood or family friend pay somebody, you know, to come and hang out. Cause my, for example, my older sister is an optometrist. So she always had to work until about seven or seven thirty because being an optometrist, it's almost like doing retail. So she had to pay this lady that lived nearby um, to come by every afternoon, you know, pick up her kids, bring the kids home, help them do the homework, fix the dinner, do a little bit of light cleaning and laundry and stuff. So you just do what you can. And hopefully you have a partner or a spouse that can also pull their weight or juggle your schedules around somehow. So it, I think I it's really hard. I definitely think that um, choosing your partner wisely is really important. And even, you know, with a marriage that didn't work out, having a, um, you know, involved uh, other partner, whatever that looks like in your family. Um, it's just, it's so essential because that should not be something that's born by one or the other. Y if you're both parents, you both need to be, you know, doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, some of my female attorney friends, they were lucky because their moms could come and take care of the baby and the mom was happy or the both the parents or the in-laws were happy to just come and live with them for a year or two. Or they live so close by that the in-laws can go pick up the kids and hang out with them and you don't have to pay them. They're so happy to help out. And I, I really envy those types of people. But unfortunately, you know, my my mom passed away a long time ago. My dad lives in Taiwan, um, you know, just had no help other than paying people to do yeah. that. So same. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that, those are the childcare options. Usually you have to pay somebody if, if you don't have like your own parent or in-laws that will help do it. Yeah. Oh, where can we find her practice? It is paulinlaw.com. Yeah. Do you want to tell our viewers a little bit about, you know, what kind of cases you would like or what cases you focus on now? Um, so I, I've sort of just developed this own, um, this little, nook of my own, which is really working with groups of um, people who are um, 
I mean, it, it, typically it's been in this landlord uh, tenant context, like um, helping form like tenant unions, getting um, tenants to be able to collectivize and and deal with some of the um, uh, the problems that come from some institutional landlords that don't want to make repairs. Uh, they want to charge, you know, the maximum amount of money that they can and then not maintain the conditions um, that are necessary. And so, but I sort of apply that to um, like, I'm working with this church in Durham that um, right before the pandemic, there was a, a deed transfer, although the church was always operating as a church and it was, it was a technical title transfer, but nothing really changed from like an operational standpoint. And they've gotten, they've gotten an $80,000 tax bill from the Durham uh, tax department. And so working with them on the uh, tax appeal is part of it, but also try, you know, trying to get community support and advocate and try to put pressure on the tax department to ultimately, um, you know, make a determination that they don't really owe any taxes. And so that's sort of this like interesting combination of legal practice and community organizing is like the work that inspires me. But, um, you know, like I had, I had a great uh, trial last year. I mean, I had, I had many trials last year that related to uh, Alamance County protesters that were arrested in the wake of George Floyd's murder. And, um, you know, I had a jury trial that was just fantastic. And so I just, like I, I like I said, I have this eclectic law practice and uh, it suits me. I don't, I don't have to do, you know, any one thing all of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And um, since we're sort of running out of time and um, there are just really so many other jobs you can get besides working for a law firm or much less a big law firm. And of course, people probably know that there are so many different government entities that hire attorneys. Like I, I had a um, sort of an attorney friend who ended up quitting her solo practice to be an attorney for the Raleigh Police Department. So, you know, police departments need attorneys, the, um, the city, you know, major municipalities have staff attorneys. There are staff attorneys that work for different branches of the court system. There are administrative law judges that work within the workers' comp system or with, um, with the social Employment Security. Security Commission deciding unemployment cases. So And Social Security as well. Oh, yeah, definitely. Social Security hires a lot of attorneys to review review decisions. Um, this is, of course, people probably already know about the um, usajobs.gov. And it sounds really great. I mean, look at these starting salaries, 148000 for a trial attorney with the Department of Justice. But you have to realize that these jobs are very prestigious and very hard to get. Um, Sometimes I do wonder how come some of these starting salaries are so much lower than the others. Like the Department of Health and Human Services job starts out at 64,660. But um, I think like it also varies depending on what city you end up working in too. Um, but definitely, you know, take a look at usajobs.gov as well as your state attorney general's Department of Justice website typically has attorney jobs listed. And um, I'm trying to think like what other unusual jobs I've heard of other attorneys doing. Um, do you know of any offhand? Um, so I've known of some people that have done work with like bar preparation courses, mm -hmm. um, be hired, you know, maybe selling, um, bar prep courses or um, preparing people in some way for um, taking the bar. And so um, I know people who've worked for LexisNexis. I, I don't know. I think sometimes they're like salespeople, but they, you know, they are attorneys that interface between LexisNexis and other lawyers. And so they understand, you know, what lawyers are doing with legal research Um programs. And so I think those are the kinds of things that I knew of a lot of like newer graduates doing as like a um, kind of like a step into like from um, law school into like the big broader world. 
Yeah. Yeah. Like almost sales or training people to use legal software. Um, yeah. There's this company called Our Family Wizard that a lot of people are ordered by the court to use to communicate in custody cases. Yeah. So there's this um, family lawyer that I know who recently quit working for her firm to work for Our Family Wizard. So I think she's like not only doing sales, but also doing training, you know, outreach to other attorneys. Um, even even within our local county courthouse, you know, Wake County Courthouse, we've had family court clerks who were actual former attorneys. Um, there's someone that works for our county bar association who was a former district attorney um, who's in charge of the CLE programs. Um, the state bar hires attorneys to be in charge of discipline, you know, like dis disciplinary hearings when attorneys might be disbarred, you know, they and, need to hire attorneys for that. And they do, they, they even hire attorneys. Like once those get to the court, I see them a lot because Wake County must have the jurisdiction over that since it's like the, you know, the government seat. And I see the, the um, attorneys that actually go and, and represent the bar association in court in some of those disciplinary proceedings. So even if you started like internally with investigations, you might be able to move into a position where you are actually doing something that's more like the practice of law. And so those are, you know, when you go into like a, a big institutional employer of any kind, whether it be a company or a government agency, there are, there are definitely opportunities to expand what you're doing and grow without leaving where, you know, you might start out in like a, almost like administrative capacity and then be able to broaden your reach because you have that um, JD. And then certainly if you have your license to practice, that makes, that gives you a lot of opportunities. I forgot that I have a friend with a JD who um, he worked for the school district as like the communications um, person and he works Somewhere else now, he doesn't work for the Orange County schools, but he made he made a lot of money as the Orange County schools like spokesperson. I mean, it was more than just spokesperson. It was like all of the communications. And so, um, you know, that's something that you wouldn't necessarily connect with the uh, having a JD, but that's, you know. He makes, I'm sure he makes more money than I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. I'm sure for him, having that law degree gave him more credibility too. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah but those jobs are kind of like unicorn jobs. Usually they don't pay as great, but because I was thinking about, of course, there are all sorts of nonprofit organizations that hire attorneys like prisoner legal services or the justice project, the ACLU, you know, um, what is it? The appellate defender's office. There's so, the legal defense of the NAACP is another one. And those to me, you know, that's that I had this vision of being like a civil rights attorney. I talked about this in the other, um, I think a little bit in the other interview. And what I realized is that while, you know, I'm not litigating like great constitutional issues, the work that I do is centered in um, justice for for people like working with tenants that have been mistreated by their landlords has no, to me now has no less significance than litigating these great constitutional issues. And in fact, like when it comes down to like somebody's day-to-day -day life, I think it has, you know, greater, my feeling anyway, it's greater impact. So, um, but I agree with Judy that like, there are those jobs, but I think those are, those are hard to get. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. When a job is really great, then people never retire. They never quit. It's, <laughs> there's only a job opening when someone dies, you know, like being a law professor, right? <laughs> or a law librarian. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Jamie. Um, why don't you hang out for a little while? We probably will say goodbye now because it's been well over an hour. But I thank you guys for being here and asking thank such you. great, insightful questions and supporting this channel. Thank and you. I appreciate you all um, listening to me blather on about the um, what I thought were many, many missteps, but, um, you know, brought me to a great place. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Okay, well, you guys have a good evening. We're going to switch gears for the next live stream. It's going to be kind of fun and funny and flippant as um, a law student from Notre Dame Law School 
Joseph Kim will be the special guest again, and we're going to react to a reaction to a K drama called Law School. So that should be kind of fun, and you know, doesn't require too many brain cells or whatever. But I hope you guys will join in on Friday night for that. So, okay, Jamie, hang out a little bit longer. Okay, okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Have a great week.